Hey everybody, so welcome to physics today. I am gone, so I'm going to kind of show you through how to solve some more complex conservation of energy problems. Hey everybody, welcome to physics today. I am out at a meeting t uh, all day today, so I'm going to show you how to solve some more of the complex conservation of energy problems. You've already answered a question from uh, the opening question. And for this, it's simple in what you've done before. So when you're reading through it, you have this rock that has a potential energy of 1,000 or ooh, 700 joules and kinetic energy of 100 joules. And if you kind of remember, the total energy, it doesn't change. So if you figured out that the total energy that the rock starts with is 800 joules as it's <clears throat> fallen down later on it'll still have a total of 800 joules so if you already know that it had 500 joules of potential energy then it should have 300 joules of kinetic energy and it's really coming back to that whole thing total energy it stays the same so we kind of think of it in this way where the rock before ooh, had a total energy coming from its potential energy and kinetic energy afterwards it has to have the same amount of energy so we write it out this way potential and kinetic before has to equal the potential and kinetic after we solve problems in that way and there's going to be some cases where you might not know the exact amount of energy but you might, should be able to figure it out and then this whole rule applies so let's see an example of that here's something that's very similar where you have a heavy weight that's lifted up using a pulley and rope and <clears throat> it's lifted up to this height where it has a lot of potential energy and then the rope is cut and it falls on this wooden post and you need to determine the speed of the weight on impact with the wooden post not like falls on the wooden post a couple seconds later it's not moving it's what's the speed on impact with it well because it has potential energy and when it falls it builds up kinetic energy we can solve it using this idea of potential energy and kinetic energy now as I solve through this, I want you to write down how you solve it in your notes because the more that you write it, the easier it gets. It's, uh, like I said, something familiar, but people often get stuck when they do these because it's another groove you get into. Once you get into that groove, though, it's really easy going. So it's your total energy before has to equal the total energy after. Or EP plus EK before has to equal EP plus EK after. It's the same thing. And well, <clears throat> in the problem, they don't tell you exactly what the energies are. Like they don't tell you what the potential energy is up here. Or they don't tell you what the kinetic energy is down here. But you could actually figure those out and that's what you're going to do. I'm going to show you some of the long way of doing this because it's essential to understand where all this information is coming from. I'll show you where you can take some shortcuts and leave things out. It makes your life a little simpler. So <clears throat> when you're solving this out you actually need to know what the potential energy is and what the kinetic energy is of that weight before. Well we know from our reference sheet that potential energy is really mass times gravity times height. So that's the equation for potential energy. You get it from your reference sheet. Kinetic energy has an equation one half times mass times velocity squared. Again, that's from your reference sheet. That's the equation for kinetic energy. And over on the other side, you'll notice that it doesn't look any different. It's still potential energy, mass times gravity times height plus kinetic energy, one-half times mass times velocity squared. The information that goes in is really going to be different. Before, 
on the weight is dropped and after the weight is dropped. That's where the differences are going to come in. And you start putting in information like the mass for the weight. Do you know the mass of the weight? You do. Because they tell you right in the problem it's 50 kilograms. So <clears throat> for the mass, we put in 50 kilograms. Here's kind of where if you want to leave some things out, that's okay. Like the units for this stuff, it kind of starts to pile up and uh, just make sure your units are in kilograms. You're going to be fine. So we know our mass is 50. For G, G here doesn't stand for grams. It stands for acceleration due to gravity. It's from gravity. And the number for gravity, you know what it is. It's 9.8. It's not negative here. It's just 9.8 because energy technically does not have any direction to it. So we don't say it's up or down or anything. Times the height. When we're talking about the height here, we have to think of it as before. And when we say before and after, it's like before. Where is it? Well, it's before it's dropped. And before it's dropped, it's up here. And they tell you that it's pulled up to a height of 8 meters above the wood post. So that's the height that goes in. It's 8 meters. And then you kind of keep working through the rest of the problem. It's plus. Now you deal with the kinetic energy. Some of this stuff is just pretty easy putting in. Yeah, like you have one half times the mass. The mass they told you was 50 kilograms. That didn't change. Times the velocity squared. Well, it's like, what's the velocity? Oh, well, if I read through the problem, and sometimes I have to do that when I read through problems or trying to solve problems, I have to kind of scan through it a couple times to make sure I got all the information. They don't actually tell you what the speed is, especially before when it's up at the top. And there's going to be a lot of times that you solve these problems where they don't tell you outright what the information is, but you can make really good assumptions. Like when the uh, weight is pulled up to the top of uh, that pulley, and just before it's, uh, the rope is cut, you could assume that it's probably not moving. And so you could say the speed is zero, and that is a safe assumption. You can say that. So we say it's zero. And you just got to remember that it's squared. Here it doesn't really matter so much, but at other places, you got to remember that velocity, that's squared. Okay? I hope all that's really good. So if you need to pause it, you need to ask questions, feel free. Now you can fill, uh, fill out the stuff on the other side. So the other side, it's the same equations, but now you have different information. You're talking about afterwards. Well, where is the uh, weight after? We're talking about when it impacts the post, so when it's down here. So here's after. So we put in information for the post after it's fallen. The mass, it's still 50 kilograms. Gravity, it's still 9.8. Those things are different. It's the height. The height is different. It's no longer up 8 meters above the wooden post. Now it's hitting the wooden post. And so we can say that the height is zero. Now that zero meters is kind of weird because some people would say, well, it's not on the ground. It's uh, not zero. Well, height is all kind of relative. So saying that it hits the post, you could say it's zero. Uh, it's kind of like putting uh, weight on the ground, or like if it actually did hit the ground. Let's say the ground in our classroom. You place that weight on the ground in our classroom, and you, someone asks you, how much potential energy does it have? You would say zero, because the height is zero. But our classroom is kind of unique. What if someone cut a hole in the uh, floor, and you could see downwards? There's actually another classroom below you. So if you cut a hole in the floor, and set that weight just above it and asked how much potential energy it had. Well, now it does have potential energy because it can fall further. But if that hole wasn't there and it was just on the ground in the classroom, 
you could say that the height is zero. It's relative. So uh, <clears throat> you could say that this is zero once it gets down as low as it can go. Then you finish up the rest of it, plus one half times the mass times the velocity squared. Mass is still 50 kilograms. The velocity, though, we don't know the velocity. In fact, that's what we're trying to solve for. So we leave it as v squared. This is how we really set it up. And this is the part that really kind of takes the longest in making sure that you got your numbers right. So you have the potential energy, kinetic energy, before it's uh, dropped. And then after it's dropped, you had to figure out what those were. So you take the mass, it's 50 kilograms times gravity times the height, it's 8 meters above the post, plus 1 half times the mass times the velocity. It's not moving when it's up here, so it's zero. Mass times gravity times height when it's down here, height is zero, and 1 half times mass times velocity squared. We didn't know what it was, so we say it's just v squared. Now that you get this part set up, it's really kind of like simplifying and solving, and this part goes by pretty quick. Because you'll notice that some things here you might actually have to uh, calculate. There are other things, though, that are really easy. Notice that when you do uh, the simplifying, everything that's being multiplied together, those things are together. But these addition symbols, those have to be counted as separate, meaning that these things are what you're simplifying. So it's kind of like those things are grouped together, you got to solve for them. When you're multiplying by zero, though, that actually causes everything to be zero. So like this 1 half times 50 times zero squared, well, zero times anything is going to be zero. So that all that piece is zero. Same thing over here, 50 times 9.8 times zero, that's all zero. So you can cross out and forget about it. I recommend not like forgetting about it when you start the problem because a lot of people tend to do that and it tends to get into trouble because you have misinformation. Prove it that it's zero and then you can go on. But then you got to simplify this stuff like 50 times 9.8 times 8. So when you multiply that through, oh, what is it? I want to do. Hold on. I had to grab my calculator. So uh, you multiply that out and you get 3,920. Didn't check that. I make mistakes. Since that equals zero, we don't have to worry about it. Since this part equals zero, we don't have to worry about it. But it's equal to this side. You have 1 half times 50 times v squared. Even though you can't do anything with the v squared, you can t simplify this part. 1 half times 50, you get 25 times v squared. And now we got something that's pretty simple. It's set up like an equation. 30,920 30, is equal to 25 times v squared. You got to solve for v. So solve for v. You divide each side by 25. 25 is going away over here. And if you divide it by 25, get 156. Point eight. And a lot of people will stop here and write their answer out like this. There's two things that tend to be wrong with this. And one thing has to be fixed before the other. First thing is you really didn't solve for v. You really solved for v squared. You have to remember the square. So it's v squared. You have to undo the square in order to solve the problem for v. But it's like, how do you undo a square? Well, like multiplying, dividing, those are opposites. Adding, subtracting, those are opposites. The opposite of square is going to be your square root. So you have to take a square root of both sides. You can do that on your calculator. When you do that, you end up with the velocity is equal to square root of that. It's 12 something, 12.52. Is equal to your velocity. You also need to use need use or bleh, you need to use units. The unit for velocity is meters per second, and that's how you end up solving those problems. It looks like a lot. It looks like it takes up a lot of space. Once you get into the groove of it, it gets pretty easy.